All right, next we have Matthew Slater and Britt Brandon Vidra and their presentation of the Geographic Information System as a teaching tool for middle school students dealing with land use, water quality, and the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So I'm Brandon Vidra. And I'm Matt Slater. And we're talking about uh, GIS as a teaching tool for middle school students. All that stuff. All right, so the first thing we want to do is let you know what the goals of our project were, as well as the reasons why we chose to do this project. Next, we're going to go into the background information so you can have a better grasp of our project and understand the big picture and the impact that our project can have. Next, we're going to talk about the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and the role that they've played in the creation of these materials in our project. Then we'll kind of pull back the curtain a little bit and uh, show you how we created our maps and our educational material. Then we'll show you those maps and educational materials and walk you through the goals of our unit and um, what our unit is comprised of. Then we'll wrap up with our conclusions and our acknowledgments. Okay, so first just to take you through uh, what we we're gonna focus on. Uh, we wanted to focus on helping students develop knowledge of and appreciation for the Chesapeake Bay. Um, all the students that go out on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's educational trips um, live within the watershed, so they're taught uh, to respect it and how important it is. Um, we also wanted to generate educational materials that help middle school students understand the impacts of land use on water quality. Um, this is especially useful in cities, um, just because the students don't get to see sort of the agricultural processes that uh, sort of uh, pollute the bay, and also uh, the runoff that development can uh, increase. Um, we also wanted to focus on geographic information systems uh, as education tools in middle schools. Um, we wanted to relate sort of that to their uh, learning objectives, so the SOLs for Virginia and the uh, Next Generation Science Standards for Maryland. Um, and our next focus was helping students gain a better understanding of mapping technologies, uh, because GIS has been on the rise in recent years um, and will become more uh, prevalent in schools. Um, and we also wanted to focus on the importance of the Bay, uh, not only historically, but just as an ecosystem. Um, and we were looking at 1985 data compared to 2015 just to show uh, just how different it is. So a little bit about us. Um, I grew up in the northern neck of Virginia, a um, little town called Montrose. Uh, I grew up fishing, boating, tubing every summer, uh, in, enjoying local seafood, stuff like that. So I, I really have an appreciation for the bay and its watershed. Um, I was also a Boy Scout, so I was taught to respect the environment and uh, leave no trace, which is one of their slogans. Um, my interest in GIS sort of came in when I came to college and started taking uh, geography courses. Um, and also throughout the ISAC classes, which we used uh, mapping technologies. Um, and going off that, uh, GIS as an educational tool, um, within the ISAC classes when we were using these mapping technologies, they were very, very helpful in uh, helping me sort of learn them too. Um, and then for me, over the years, I've had a few internships with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. My senior year of high school, I worked on a Claggett Farm, which is the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's um, organic farm located in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. And on that farm, I kind of helped out as much as I could and started to learn some of the educational aspects of the farm, such as uh, what farmers can do to responsibly manage their soil erosion and their pollution. Then two summers ago, I worked with CBF's education department um, on the Potomac River, where we took school groups out on the Potomac and the Anacostia Rivers, and we taught them about local aquatic life uh, water quality standards, as well as the impact that an individual can have on the, those local waterways, as well as the watershed as a whole. And then last summer, I worked at uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's main office located in Annapolis, doing GIS work and data analysis. So in all of my experience with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, I kind of saw that the one thing that they hadn't really looked at, into too much was a combination of those two passions of mine, GIS work and environmental education. So what Brandon and I wanted to do with this project was bring those two together and create something that CBF could use in the classrooms. Um, so just to give you a little background information on Chesapeake Bay and its watershed, um, as you can see in this picture here, uh, this is the entirety of the watershed and then it's colorized to show the different sub-watersheds of the major rivers. Um, all in all, it uh, covers about 64,000 square miles in six different states and that includes New York, Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and DC. Um, there are 50 ma major rivers and streams throughout the watershed, and that doesn't include all the different uh, creeks that run into those rivers and streams. And uh, about 17 million people live and work within the watershed. 
and it's home to over 3,000 species of flora and fauna. It's also the largest estuary in the United States and the third largest estuary in the world. That's pretty important. Um, and something important to note also is uh, there are significant environmental problems and associated regulation that goes with these problems. Um, so the majority of the rivers and streams are impaired under the Clean Water Act of 1977 and the Water Quality Act of uh, 1987. And the majority of these are impaired by different contaminants such as uh, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, uh, metals, and uh, nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, which comes from the agricultural processes. Um, so what is GIS? Uh, it stands for a Geographic Information System, and uh, it's a computer system for capturing, storing, checking, and displaying data related to positions on the surface. Um, it can show many different layers, uh, as you can see in the bottom right pic, uh, that it shows the real world, and then uh, what you can put into GIS is uh, imagery, elevation data, transportation, addresses, boundaries, water features, survey control, and uh, your own data. Um, so the layers are actually divided into two separate uh, categories, and that's uh, physical and thematic. So physical would be um, street, um, addresses, uh, state lines, rivers, stuff like that. And thematic would be stuff like uh, land cover, elevation, uh, population density, stuff like that. Um, so some of the software uh, that is considered GIS would be um, ArcMap, uh, PCI Geomatica, uh, RGS Online and different online resources such as uh, FieldScope. Um, and GIS is a super powerful tool that can be used for a lot of different things. Um, for example, uh, watershed modeling, population density, land cover, uh, sediment movement, storm events, and what we focused on, education. Um, and like I said before, it's an extremely powerful tool. Uh, the data can be queried, so uh, the user can ask questions and sort of get uh, a data analysis from that. Um, for accessibility, it's become a lot more accessible to uh, educate educators in more recent years, but it's still considered an expensive technology because uh, you do you have to pay money to get a license to get the programs from it. So GIS is a very powerful educational tool, just as Brandon was saying, but it's painfully underutilized in school systems. It allows students to get a hands-on understanding of geography, as well as increasing their spatial analysis skills and their critical thinking skills. It has been proven that GIS use can have a positive impact on all realms of study as it helps increase uh, students' complex problem solving skills, which can be applied in all subjects. Um, and teachers do understand this impact. However, there are not enough resources in many school districts to give teachers the training that they need to fully understand this and to give students the access to GIS. If teachers are unable to understand, use, and teach GIS effectively, it won't be integrated into school systems. We understood this, so we wanted to create a simple yet powerful set of maps that could be easily accessed and understood by everyone. To do this, we use ArcGIS, which is a simpler kind of watered down version of the ArcMap uh, application. And um, so there's a recently been a push to integrate technology into schools. Um, and GIS is a perfect example of a technology that uh, could really have a positive impact on education. For example, I participated in a program called the Geospatial Semester, which is actually a program run through JMU, which gives high school students a chance to get their hands on GIS and kind of learn and understand what it is and how to use it. Uh, so I know for, from experience, if school districts do have the supplies to give teachers the resources necessary, to have GIS in school systems, ArcGIS, as well as ArcGIS Online could have a major positive impact on education. So we worked with CBF to produce a classroom-based unit utilizing GIS. A little background information on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. They were uh, founded in 1967 and they are the largest independent conservation organization dedicated solely to saving the Chesapeake Bay. They look to use effective science-based solutions to solve issues plaguing the bay, as well as the waterways inside of the watershed. To get a better grasp on these issues, they have uh, offices located in Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and DC, as well as 15 field offices that they run uh, education trips out of. To save the bay, CBF turns to advocacy, litigation, restoration, and education. In particular, they have an outstanding education program where they take school groups onto water and uh, teach them about water quality standards, the watershed as a whole, 
as well as the impact that each individual can have on the watershed and their local waterways. However, many of these activities are hands-on and quick-paced, so Brandon and I wanted to introduce another layer to these programs utilizing GIS. We we're hoping that uh, we could help students look at the watershed and understand the watershed in a different way while still giving students the personalized, localized experience that CBF is famous for. Um, so, as I mentioned before, we had a, our overall goal was to create a way to visualize the impact of land use over time on the Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. To do this, we were focusing on five areas that we'll go into more depth in on the next slide. Um, but within each area, we wanted to look at how land use has, has changed over time and connect that to the water quality change in time over in that area. Um, so in our research, we saw that land use has the largest impact on nitrogen, phosphorus, and turbidity. So those are the three parameters of water quality that we focused on the most. Um, and then when we were creating our unit, uh, we wanted to make sure that students could get a big picture and a broad overview of the entire watershed while still keeping that uh, personalized, localized aspect. Um, so we were hoping that by seeing both the big and the small picture, students could gain a better understanding of the watershed as a whole, as well as their local waterways. Uh, so these are the sites we chose. We chose the Brock Center in Virginia Beach, Virginia, which is CBF's newest office. Then we chose the Smith Island Environmental Education Program, which is CBF's multi-day education program located in the middle of the bay. Then we did the Potomac River Environmental, Environmental Education Program, which is the one that I helped work with uh, a couple summers ago in DC. Then we chose the Merrill Center, CBF's main office in Annapolis. And finally, the Baltimore Harbor Environmental Education Program in Baltimore. So we chose these sites because CBF already has education programs in place at these locations. And by choosing sites where CBF has programs in place, we were hoping that we could reach the largest number of students. So obviously with creating uh, educational units, um, we wanted to sort of focus around the learning objectives of both Virginia and Maryland. Um, so with Virginia, uh, some of you might know, we use the standards of learning or SOLs. Um, and specifically, when we were looking at uh, grade six science ecosystems <coughs> category. Um, so under that, uh, students are expected to be able to investigate and understand natural processes and human interactions with watersheds. So this would include um, health of ecosystems and watersheds, uh, location and structure of Virginia, regional watersheds, uh, river and stream processes, uh, what wetlands are, what estuaries are, and the relationships between ecosystem dynamics and human activity. Um, Maryland is a little bit different. They have the next generation science standards. Um, and these were created, uh, it was a multi-state effort to create new educational standards that are rich in content and practice, and they're arranged in a coherent manner across disciplines and grades to provide students an internationally benchmarked education. Um, and like I said, it was developed by 26 states um, in conjunction with the National Science Teachers Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the National Research Council, and ACHIEVE, which is a nonprofit organization that focuses on uh, developing math, English, and science standards. Um, so under the Next Generation Science Standards, uh, they sort of focused around, um, they grouped together their six through eight uh, curriculum. Um, so. What the students are expected to know is the interrelationship between humans and water quality. Um, so the different types of pollution, point and non-point, uh, the Chesapeake Bay watershed and how uh, they have an impact on it, and eutrophication, which is the uh, presence of excess nutrients in the water from agricultural processes. Uh, they're also expected to know the interrelationship between humans and land resources, so know uh, of what wetlands are, uh, about them, and uh, soil conservation and also land use planning. <coughs> So when we started to create our materials, uh, we needed to develop the scope for our project. And to do so, we were debating between working with middle school students and working with high school students. Um, and because CBF, uh, the education program, they deal a lot with middle school students, and that's typically what they take out on their uh, trips, we decided to focus on middle school students. Um, so then we began having discussions with a bunch of uh, educators. So uh, Eric Fitzgerald and Tammy Stone of Rockingham County, Virginia Public Schools uh, turned us towards place-based education. And that basically means um, students are learning about the ecosystem uh, right outside their window or in their backyard, uh, just because it's more relevant to them, it gets them engaged, and they're more interested in it. Um, so then we started talking to Dr. Colbert of JMU. Um, 
And he told us about Story Maps and Cookie Cutter Labs. And Story Maps, we'll touch on in a few slides. But um, Cookie Cutter Labs are labs or assignments that are very straightforward. Um, everything is basically laid out, which buttons you press, press to get the result you want. Um, and those are very helpful for middle school students, especially with GIS, because they don't have um, any knowledge of the software. And it can be a little uh, daunting to look at for the first time. Um, and then we also wanted to utilize uh, online resources, such as uh, Story Maps, RGS Online, and um, FieldScope, which was uh, CBF and National Geographic um, working together to create an online GIS resource. Um, so we used STEM curriculum as a guide for our curriculum that we created. Um, and that was also in conjunction with the National Center for Rural Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mem Mathematics Education uh, Outreach. Uh, specifically under their geospatial technology education materials, and so we sort of used their curriculum as a guideline for creating our own. And again, we wanted to look at the, uh, make sure that we focused on the learning objectives for Virginia and Maryland so that the students got the most out of uh, what we were presenting. All right, so how did we actually do this using ArcGIS? First of all, we had to collect the data. Um, the data was gathered from the Chesapeake Bay Program Data Hub, as well as past CBF education trips. Originally, we were looking at seven parameters of water quality, um, obviously nitrogen, phosphorus, and turbidity, as well as temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, and salinity. We chose those seven because uh, those, are the, those are the parameters that students test for when they actually go on the CBS education trips. Um, but as we were talking about before, land use has the biggest impact on phosphorus, nitrogen, and turbidity, so those are the three we focused on. Uh, so the data we downloaded from the Chesapeake Bay Program Data Hub was from monitoring, monitoring stations all throughout the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So we were dealing with some pretty big Excel files. Uh, so to get those into ArcMap, we use the absolute XY tool, which places uh, data points on the map based off the longitude and latitude in the Excel files. So after we had all the data points located on the map, we created buffers around our five sites that we mentioned earlier and got rid of all the excess data points. So we were just looking at our data points of, data points of interest. Once we had those, we wanted to find the averages of each region for 1985 and 2015. So we moved the data back into Excel because it's easier to manipulate the data that way. Uh, found the averages and then moved it back into ArcMap where we were able to create layers and play around with it so we could get it the way we wanted. And then the, those were the layers that we were able to put into ArcGIS Online and Story Maps. Uh, so Story Maps is an application within ArcGIS Online and it's used to tell a story and show change over time. And like I said before, this is what we uh, put our layers from ArcMap into. Um, so as you can see here, uh, the photo on the left is the land cover analysis of 1985. Uh, the photo on the right is the land cover analysis of 2015. <coughs> and then over here you have the different um, uh, pixels and what they represent. Um, so the way this is done, each pixel in an image is classified um, and it basically gives it a color um, that we decided. And that's how you can see, um, specifically if you look at, uh, there's DC. Um, there's a lot of red, so obviously it's very developed. Um, some changes to note, there's a ton of, in 1985, there's not really that much development in between all of these, but as you can see, uh, just sort of spreading as time goes on. And there's also um, a lot of development down in the Virginia Beach area. So. Wait. Okay. Uh, so we're going to show you what we created on Story Maps. Um, so Story Maps is a relatively new technology, and as, I, as we were talking about before, um, it's not as powerful of a version as ArcMap Online, or the full ArcMap application. So we were having a lot of trouble getting the land use from 1985, as well as the imagery into story maps. So that's an issue that we're still trying to work on and we should fix within the next week or so. Um, so this is what the students would actually be looking at when they complete their unit. And as you can see, it's very easy to click between uh, 1985 values and 2015 values. So we broke these up into the three different parameters, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and turbidity. And 
Uh, students would be clicking between the two, between 1985 and 2015 for each parameter, and noting some of the differences. Um, as I said, we're hoping to get the imagery for 1985, so when they click on 1985 maps, they would see the actual imagery from 1985 rather than just the 2015 imagery. So it would be a little easier to note the changes in land use. Um, so you can zoom into individual regions, and you can click on data points to see what their values are. And then you can very easily switch between 2015 to look at the same region and see what has changed. Um, and then you can click on the buffers to see the average values for each region. And like I said, you can switch back and forth very easily and look at the same thing. Um, so in front of you, you have the uh, units that were created. Uh, the first one that the students would start with would be the um, impact of land use on water quality individual assignment. Um, and so they'd be going to the story maps site that we just looked at, um, and we're asking them to find their school or house and identify uh, like rural and urban areas, the differences between those two. Um, and then they would just be looking at uh, the imagery and just sort of uh, looking at how water quality has changed over time. Um, and that's front and back, so there's different questions for that. Um, and then once they finish the individual assignment, they would move on to the group assignment, and they would be assigned uh, one of the sites that we um, showed in the picture before, on the previous slides. Um, and they would just be looking at the differences between uh, their region compared to other regions. Um, and again, that's front and back. Um, and then, uh, not all schools are going to be able to go on the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's educational trips, so the um, individual and group activity um, that I just talked about would sort of be a standalone thing. And um, the schools that are able to go um, on the educational trips after they complete the uh, pre-trip activities would come back from their trips after collecting data and complete the uh, post-trip activity. And that's shown with the post-trip questions. Um, so they'd be comparing uh, averages for uh, data from 1985 to what they collected, um, averages for 2015 to what they collected, and then looking at the differences between those. Um, and then, just again, uh, to reiterate, our deliverables would be the story maps and RGS uh, data set. Those are uplo uploaded onto RGS Online, so anyone with an RGS Online account can access those and use those for whatever they may need. Um, sort of talk about the goals for the classroom unit. Uh, I sort of touched on this in my last discussion, but um, for the individual assignment, uh, we wanted the students to be able to understand uh, land use and the impact of nitrogen, phosphorus, and turbidity um, on water quality. And we also wanted them to make connections between uh, the change in land use and the impact that that has on nitrogen, phosphorus, and turbidity. Um, for the group activity, we wanted them to explore different regions of the watershed, watershed uh, look at all the different sites that we had uh, developed, and also make connections between uh, the changes in land use and water quality, and determine what the largest issue in their region is and what they can do to fix it. Um, and then the ones that are uh, lucky enough to go on the CBF education trips on the boat uh, would be completing the post-trip activity. Um, and we wanted them to be able to compare the data on the trip to the averages from 2015 and uh, 1985, and then consider the data collected and uh, look at the averages and see what that means for their local watershed and the base watershed as a whole. Um, so we showed our deliverables to Tammy Stone and Eric Fitzgerald at Rockham uh, County, Virginia Public Schools, and they seemed pleased. We also beta tested on uh, some of our peers. Um, obviously, showing it to college students is a little different than uh, showing this to middle schoolers just because they might have uh, previous GIS experience um, or they're just better at understanding directions. Um, so we're looking to present, <laughs> we're looking to present to middle schoolers in the future. What did um, you say? <laughs> we all know it's true. Um, we're looking to present to middle schoolers in the future just to sort of uh, test it out a little bit more before CBF is able to utilize it. All right, so obviously we ran into a few roadblocks during this experience. Um, because this is such a new up and coming field, the combination of education and GIS, CBF was kind of unable to give us much <coughs> guidance. So we, it was kind of up to Brandon and I to 
narrow down our scope and figure out what we could do that would most benefit students. Um, also, obviously we have a lack of experience creating curriculum. We've both been in school for about 16 years now, but we've never been on the other side actually making the curriculum. So there, we had a few growing pains, but uh, we were lucky enough to talk to a few educators who were able to point us in the right direction and get us moving. Um, and then, like we were talking about before, uh, ArcGIS Online and Story Maps are relatively new and not as powerful as the full ArcMap application. So it's very hard to transfer large files from one another. Um, but, uh, so we ran into some trouble with the 1985 imagery and the 1985 land use. But like I said before, we are hoping to get those figured out within the next week or so. Um, so how will this be used? We've sort of been talking about it throughout the presentation, but um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation actually approached us with this. Um, we worked with their educators to generate this stuff, so we're hoping that this is something that they can use um, in supplement to their educational trips on the Bay. Um, as I mentioned before, it's gonna be uploaded to RGS Online, so it can be utilized by anyone with an RGS Online account. Um, and just as we use the STEM curriculums as a guideline for creating our educational materials, we're hoping that maybe uh, our educational materials can be used as a guideline for other curriculum in the future. So we'd like to thank, first of all, Dr. Carol Nash, who was our advisor and helped walk us through this project for the past two years. Uh, we'd also like to thank Katie Leverton, the GIS specialist at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for all of her help with the GIS work. Then Sam Wolford and Ian Robbins, two educators at the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, for their help narrowing down our scope and uh, their help with the curriculum. Then Dr. Robert Colvord, who is the Dean of the College of Integrated Science and Engineering here at JMU, for his help with uh, story maps and also pointing us in the direction of the cookie cutter labs. Then Tammy Stone and Eric Fitzgerald of the Rocky and County Virginia Public School System for helping us with place-based education and uh, getting our curriculum down. Then Dr. Cindy Clevicus, uh, an ISAP professor here at JMU for putting us in contact with Tammy Stone and Eric Fitzgerald. And then finally, Sarah Nutt Brown, who is a student here at JMU who helped us with our GIS work. And we have just our references. This is going to be on RGS online. I know some students in ISAT have um, accounts on there. Is it going to be a live lesson that anyone can use with an account at some point, or is it already? Uh, so the the map, the story map that I showed you guys, that is already up, and we are hoping to add some attachments and some links to the lessons that we created, so anybody can use them. Yeah. Oh, with the uh, with the 2015 to 1985 comparison of uh, whether lane use or dissolve the two or any of those different categories. Were you able to see a percent change? Was RGIS able to calculate that for you or with Excel so you can show the students that? Um, that was another issue that we had. Uh, the land cover analysis was something that we weren't familiar with, um, and that's something that we were working with uh, Sarah and Brown on to sort of uh, develop in the next week or so. so. But um, you can look yeah. at the colors. And yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah. So I, I was wondering if there was like, if you could associate a number with that yeah. based off that. I just want to tell you that this is absolutely brilliant. <laughs> okay, just just go in there. Um, I have worked pretty well with middle schoolers and elementary schoolers in various times and places, and that is going to be such a powerful tool. Um, my question is, how hard would this be to recreate? like at a, a smaller scale, like say the JMU Arboretum. Is that something that would, would be another senior project? Is it something that is bigger than a senior project? Well, the biggest issue that we found was actually having enough data points to recreate this. We, we were first talking about kind of making it very localized and having students pick out like streams that they frequent or things like that. So I don't know if something like the Arboretum would have enough data, historical data as well as recent data. So you kind of need like a big area. With those five spots you looked at, 
was there one that where there was a big change in pollution, and was there one where there was significantly less change in pollution? Well, you could kind of see um, all of them actually showed a little bit of a decrease in both nitrogen and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. However, the turbidity, especially in the Baltimore area as well as the DC area, is uh, decreasing actually. So. So how do you envision getting teachers who, as we know, are absolutely crunched for time to learn how to use this software? Um, I, I just think this is a phenomenal teaching tool, but one of the things I always think of as a faculty member when I'm faced with something new like this, that it's like we're swimming toward it and we just can't quite get there because the time is a big issue. What do you think would be the best way to introduce this to teachers? Well, uh, through the research that we did, we definitely found that uh, time is something that teachers with GIS, they, they just don't have the time to learn how to use the software. And that's sort of why we wanted to focus on uh, the online resources, just because they are um, very simple, very easy to use. And they could possibly be used as like a stepping stone into the uh, GIS um, like software art map. But do you think that the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, for example, might sponsor a weekend workshop for teachers? that they could get some recertification points so that they could learn some of the basics. Because you all know now from doing this that when you present information to people, you want to you want to know it. You want to be able to move within it. You don't just want to say, somebody told me I need to press this button, right? right, right. So do you think CBF, I mean, because CBF is known for having its incredible teacher education programs. Right. Well, when we talked to Sam and Ian, uh, the two educators for CBF, they actually said that when we talked to them maybe two, three months ago, they said within the next couple of weeks they will be doing a workshop for teachers learning about GIS in Maryland. So it seems like they're already on their way to okay. hosting those workshops. So you're going to slide this to them? <laughs> That's the goal. Okay. That's the goal. All right. Very good. Very good. Questions? Thank you.